Hello, welcome to the Violin Podcast. For everybody who's watching, I have Dr. Rene Paul Gauthier with me on this wonderful episode seven of the Violin Podcast. Dr. Rene, thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, I'm so happy to be with you, Eric. Yeah, and it's actually uh, we had a, we had a small chat before we began, and it's nice to be able to talk to another violin podcaster. I think that's the most exciting thing about this interview for me. Uh, so there are a lot of topics that I do want to talk about with you, uh, with you know the Mind Over Finger podcast, with uh, practice tips, audition tips. But before we get into all of that, I just want to have the audience get to know you a little bit. Can you just describe uh, what you've been doing with your career in the violin? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm originally from Quebec, so that's where the French accent comes from. Mm. And uh, I'm from a family of musicians. My father was a music teacher, and so was my mother. And my mother actually ended up founding a school of music, a nonprofit school. So I kind of grew up under her desk over there, surrounded by music. And um, the origin story I like to talk about because it's very influential in my life is the fact that my mother always practiced with me as a kid. So for me, it wasn't uh, you know, a once a week thing, but it was a daily activity. And my... You know, I would say my actions were always guided. So mindfulness and focus in practice were introduced to me from a very early age, even though I didn't really know what was going on right now. I just thought it was so annoying because I had to practice with my mom all the time. And, um, you know, we had our moments. It wasn't always easy. And I also had a wonderful violin teacher starting at the age of nine who was really um, keen on having his students really pay attention and listen and um, you know we we're often given a lot of um, techniques and tips but he was always directing our attention and saying do you hear that do you feel that and asking a lot of questions and it, it's really kind of where my kind of interest for mindful practice came even though I didn't realize what was being taught to me at the time and it's a little bit later when I started my own career and I realized that I had times where I would practice aimlessly and just punch in time in the practice room. And then there are other times where, you know, you're in the pinch, you're in the crunch, you have a competition and you need to get those results because the concert or the competition or the audition are the next day. And I started to realize that I had different practice techniques for those times. I was practicing very differently. It was very focused and, um, it was, you know, I could set goals I knew how to, you know, target my attention towards very specific things and fix them very quickly. Um, anyway, after school, I um, I did a, a bunch of stuff with chamber music, and I joined New World Symphony, and uh, ended up in Ottawa, Ontario, where I was with the National Arts Center Orchestra, and um, I did uh, one year in the Calgary Phil, and then you know my husband's career brought us here to Chicago, where I now am, and. Um, I play with a different, uh, you know, bunch of organizations around town. And I also teach at North Park University. And it's really when I started teaching there that I was really focused on figuring out a way to really help my students practice efficiently. And also, as time went on, I really wanted to rekindle my, my love of playing, my love of practicing, because I think that we all start playing music because we loved it at some point. You know, there's always like that moment in our childhood where we remember that feeling of, oh, wow, this is awesome. This is what I want to do. And sometimes when we turn professional, we lose some of that. You know, there's, there's a lot of competition and jaded people out there and, you know, long commutes and low pay and all of those things that kind of... I would say a road at our enthusiasm. So for me, it was ways to figure out how to really help my students practice mindfully, but also really develop a love of the process itself and keep the enthusiasm going. So in a big nutshell, this is it. <laughs> and of course, practice is such a huge topic. How do we practice? How long do we practice? You know, different practice techniques. I know um, I, I do want to comment on what you said about, you know, the joy of music. Because sometimes we don't we don't make practice fun enough for us, mm -hmm. and I I happen to be teaching a lot of youngsters these days from ages five uh, through high school, and trying to create some 
creative ways for them to enjoy the practice, to enjoy the process. And it's always a struggle, wouldn't you agree? It's always a challenge. Yes, absolutely. There's this, I don't know, this aura of it's so cool to punch in the time and work hard. And, you know, it's like we see these montage from movies where you've got, you know, Rocky running up the mountain and in the snow and he's struggling. And we, we imagine that this is how practicing has to feel. But I find that for myself, the more I really, I think it starts with asking questions, really not just moving aimlessly, right? Like you can't just go like this for two hours and call that practicing. You got to think a little bit. So then we, when we ask questions, we figure out how to solve problems, but also ask ourselves, okay, how can I make that enjoyable? How can I make that interesting? It really comes with making things interesting and then we become engaged. And then not only do we have more fun, but we solve problems faster. Yeah, and I think that's also part of the entrepreneurial mindset that I think that you and I have uh, when it start, comes to starting the podcast and trying to run a business. It's always the question of asking why. You know, mm-hmm. why, like, why am I out of tune? Why do I sound screechy? Why, you know, all those, I think um, the first question should be, why is it this way? I know that mm-hmm. for, for myself, it's worked for me. And uh, please leave a comment down below if you find there are any other questions or strategies that you think that help are helpful. But asking why something is first, why is it out of tune? Why is my hand cramped? You know, little details like that can really, again, help with the process of practicing. And you talk a lot about that in your podcast. Can you talk about how the podcast started, where the idea came from? Yes, I remember the moment the idea came from. I spent a lot of time in the car in Chicago. And anyone who lives in the big city will know that. Yeah, that I-90, 94 merger is a a beast. (laughs) It's the worst. (laughs) The Eden Expressway, totally off topic, but the Eden to the Kennedy, that merger, it's the worst. (laughs) And it's always under construction. And so uh, no, nothing is near. You're always in the car. And I love listening to podcasts so much. So I listen to tons of podcasts. And even though I, I you know, love all, a lot of the podcasters out there and so many of the wonderful you know, episodes that I've been listening to, you will probably find the same thing that I did because you created your own podcast is that sometimes there are questions that you have in your mind as a guest is speaking on the podcast. And you want to ask that question and you want to know the answer to this question. Or maybe the format doesn't fit you perfectly. And then I remember I was sitting, I was actually driving back from the Iowa Music Educator Conference uh, where I had just given a talk about my deep practice model. And I was listening to a podcast and I kept running questions in my head. And once all of a sudden I thought, I should have my own podcast. And once I had this idea in my head, it never left. And at first I was like, well, no, you don't just start a podcast like this. And I'm not a techie. I don't understand technology. It's probably expensive. And then I started to think, you know, I could just research how it works and see if it's doable. And there was something about, I I just love talking about practice and music making and uh, preparing for concerts and what makes us love music. And I just love these conversations so much. And I have so many fun conversations with a lot of friends that sometimes I think, oh, if my students could sit in on this conversation, this would, you know, illustrate perfectly what I was telling so-and-so in her lesson yesterday. And um, so it's kind of all of these things coming together that really just made me want to sit down, have these conversations recorded for uh, myself, but also for my students and for anyone who might benefit from it. And yeah, you know, it's, it's been so much fun. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's so much fun. Yeah, I think the first step is just to get started. I think a lot of people are just so afraid, like, am I am I worthy of, you know, the podcast medium? And I remember my first episode on my other podcast, The Everyday Musician, where I, I interview local musicians doing amazing things in their communities. And I remember I was listening to myself like, oh God, I sound awful. And that kind of reflected, you know, how I thought of myself as a violinist. I'm like, oh, I really sound like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think the I think the beauty of podcasts is that you can kind of just 
you know, you put on your earbuds and you just go wherever and you can, you know, you, you have like, you, you know, your voice in their ears and my voice in their ears. Right. And I think yes. that's the beauty of how convenient podcasting is. And, and, uh, it's been such a blast, you know. I love podcasting, especially what you what you're saying with talking and learning new things from other, you know, professionals and master violinists. And I really like what you said that you use the podcast to help your students because that's is very similar to what I do. And with the everyday musician, I talk about, you know, that everybody goes through some kind of struggle to achieve their dream, right? Mm -hmm. And to give them the grand scheme of things, the point of it is to help with understanding that, you know, it's a process. It, it's a yeah. journey. It takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight, especially in the society that we have. Um, we want things very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially with what you're saying with practicing and knowing how to practice and mindful practicing does take some work and take some getting used to. So, um, and, you know, another reason I love podcasting is that there's a completion feeling that we never get from practicing and performing. You know, how did you ever walk off stage and think that Mendelssohn concerto, I just nailed it. That's it. Can't be better. You know, mm -hmm. don't have to do it ever again. But with a podcast episode, it's like you say, like playing music, it's a process. It's ever evolving. We're always learning, always growing. But with a podcast, I record it. I edit it. I put it out there. Is it perfect? I don't know. Is it NPR quality? Probably not. Um, but it's bringing value to, you know, hopefully one person and it's out there and it's finished. And I think that's probably the same satisfaction that people get when they're picking up a hobby. You know, you, you knit the sweater. Once it's done, it's done. So this, it's kind of that feeling of creating something and it's out there and it's finished and you can move on to the next episode and the next conversation and revisit it any time. And that's not a feeling I get often in the practice room. Right. With violin, we're never done. You know, mm -hmm. if for one moment you think you're done with the piece, I think that's already the wrong mindset, especially if you're professional, because you're like, okay, there's Paganini concerto number one. I played it. I touched it. <laughs> I don't have to touch it again. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, especially scales, you know, I emphasize scales with my students. I'm like, you know, scales and arpeggios, you'll never be done with them. Mm -hmm. I even like, I even put them, you know, I try to, I try to think of the student in their shoes. I'm like, okay, well, if I was 10 years old, what was I thinking back then? Right. And try to, you know, make it, make it a fun, approachable way. But yeah, especially like scales and arpeggios, those are, those are, that, that's, that in itself is a journey. Yes. And, yeah. and scale in our pages, they often feel dreadful because we don't try to make them interesting. We're passively playing them. My teacher says I should practice my scale. And sure, maybe once in a while we'll practice a shift or <laughs> once in the blue moon, someone will pay attention to their sound quality when they're practicing their scales. I'm just kidding. Right. Yeah. And the thing with scales is that they feel dreadful because people usually just play through them without thinking much. But I think that if we really make the effort to make them interesting by asking questions and by really investigating and maybe throwing in some games with ourselves, uh, scales can be so much fun. And, you know, as we know, they are the basis of our technique. So there are ways to make them fun. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And let's talk about auditions because mm -hmm. auditions are a tricky topic. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yes, you know, it's a necessary evil. I think that the process is far from perfect, but it's, you know, it's what we came to after years of trying many, many things. And, um, you know, maybe there will be another way in the future. I'm not sure. Um, and at the same time, I think if we approach auditions as a step in our journey, an opportunity for growth, uh, you know how it is. Like uh, if, if you do the Tour de France, you have all of these, you know, one day after day and you stop and you rest. So the each audition, I mean, if you win the first one, that's amazing. <laughs> but if not, they can be uh, just another stepping stone to the next big thing. 
And it's kind of the same way when we're kids, right? The young kids take, uh, I'm in Illinois, so we have ILMEA. Uh, you have uh, in Canada, there's a role conservatory. So you get your next R RCM uh, level and we do juries. And, you know, I think that competitions and auditions can be really wonderful instruments of growth, uh, but they have to be approached in that mindset. Yeah, especially with orchestra auditions. What was the process like when you were taking auditions in the past? Like, how can you describe to the listener, to the viewer, what an audition process entails? It's very different for me each time. And um, like I said, I was really good at prioritization. That's a hard word for a French Canadian, but I think it came out I all think right. Even for English, because prioritization, yeah, it's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, so knowing what to practice and how being organized is really good. I mean, the first thing I would do for everyone, I'm sorry, it sounds like such a simple thing, but just put the music together, you know, <laughs> <laughs> start there. Uh, but after that, there's so many, so many tips. Um, I have my own program where I talk to people about um, preparing for auditions. There's some great resources out there. One of my favorite book is Performance Success by Don Green. And uh -huh. Audition Success, but also by Don Green, is a great complement to this book. But I would really start with Performance Success. And there's so many... Um, mental strategies we can use as well is very important but i think that in auditions we need to think of being a better musician and preparing each excerpts really well so it's hand in hand so you have to really attend to the fundamentals so don't neglect any of the technical work the skills the exercises all of these things but really keep musicianship at um you know really high on your list of priorities it's really important and i remember that um i remember my first big audition after new world symphony uh was san francisco symphony and i don't know i didn't really have a process and i i walked in the room it, it was like it's such a learning curve because there's so many things um from showing up at 8 a.m. and then picking number 53 or something like this, and then like having to aim <laughs> in the San Francisco streets for hours and learning that you shouldn't do that. And um, just showing up in the room and feeling really like having an out of body experience. It's just really like, oh my gosh, who is this person playing? I don't know. And I came out of this, of course, I didn't advance. And I came out of it with such a clear idea of the things I would want to do in the future, which was to be really organized, uh, record myself. I also came up with an idea of keeping track of my notes and note takings. Sure. We can all give a million the short, uh, not short charts. I'm thinking of my two kids. Um, <laughs> you can keep like practice charts and things like this, but don't just take someone's chart and fill it. You know, you have to, put some thoughts into how do I like to work and come up with your own note-taking process. I think that's really important. And charts can be great. They're, they can be great inspirations, but I think it's important to figure out a way to keep track of your progress that works for you. And that's really important. Each audition will be different. I remember the one of the last audition I took, I was so tired of these excerpts and the list wasn't too long. And I knew most of them. And I thought, you know, I really don't feel it. I don't want to practice, but I want to take this audition and I want to do well. So what can I do? And the answer was obvious. I need to play better in general if I want to play these excerpts better because I've practiced them tons. How can I get them better? And who wants to practice Schumann 2 again, you know? So I just started having tons of fun with picking out exercises and modifying etudes to fit whatever excerpt and just uh, just turn passages from each excerpt into a mini etude inside that passage and just really come up with as many creative ways to practice them as I could because I was at that stage where I was really kind of uh, running in circles mm -hmm. and that made the process so much fun. 
I think we often forget with orchestra excerpts. By the way, I like practicing orchestra excerpts. I think they're fun. It's a great etude practice. But I think we often forget that it's also the music that we need to mm. that we need to show the panel behind the screen. And it's even like twenty times harder to do that behind the screen.、Mm-hmm. And I mean, of course, these auditions is the fairest way that we know. How to do right now? You know, everything is based on audio. You know, you have a screen in front of you, so there's no bias and completely fair. And and oftentimes, if you're if you're listening to the podcast, then that's typically how professional auditions go. You are given a number, and I remember so distinctly. I had a Utah Symphony audition, and probably the listeners know that already. But I had an audition with Utah Symphony.、Uh, I was staying with a colleague at the time, and I was given a number, round. You know, I got my deposit check back, and I'm like, okay, well now I have to s- spend maybe 45 to an hour, pract- you know, warming up with these excerpts, you know, in a room full of other people who are taking the same audition, right? And it can be super, super nerve wracking. And I think the ultimate goal is not just to play. The excerpts well because you know there are techniques right okay well, like in the Mendelssohn scherzo you know there's that forte piano what does that mean you know like little little details like that but at the end of the day it's all about playing the music that you believe in and trying to show yourself through the music that,、mm-hmm. that you've studied the music you know what the piece is about all those extra things. Like it needs to be in tune, in time, and in tone. And <laughs> that's and that's and that's where the two of the France, <laughs> that's、yes. where the two of the France thing comes into play. And that like that's you know the music is important, but you gotta you gotta play in tune, gotta have good bow control. You have to make sure that you know your nerves are in check, especially you know especially you know you're probably dealing with a lot of rep in a very short amount of time. Sometimes you have maybe two、mm-hmm. or three rehearsals for these、uh, cycles. So there's a、yeah. quick turnaround time.、Uh, I love your yeah, I love it, your it can't ideas. Be just、yeah. like, it can't just be the technique. So, yes, the fundamentals have to be there, and it's exactly what you said. There needs to be more. Exactly what you said. Just show that you understand the music and that you are responding to what's on the page. Right, because especially when I teach these kids,、um, my students, and. It's it's about the history of the composer. It's about the history of the piece. What was the composer feeling? What was he or she thinking about during the time of the piece? You know, those are all pretty important.、Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's irrelevant, but it's also good to know just to have like some kind of back knowledge.、Um, and I and actually, I'd love to know your thoughts on the Schumann Scherzo, <laughs> Schumann Scherzo excerpt, which is probably one of the scariest ones、um, out there for anyone who doesn't know. All of, sometimes orchestras, I think, ask for maybe even nine measures, and that's that's enough for them to、yeah. to know, like, okay, you can go to the second round or not. So, and the funny thing with the Schumann Scherzo is we all we rarely play it as an excerpt the way it would be played if it was the orchestra part, and it's a really it's a really interesting excerpt <laughs> to play. Yeah, I th- I think so. I mean, a lot of it is just.、Uh, You know, dare I say, muscle memory? It's not muscle、mm-hmm. memory, right? But it's there's 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 that level where you have to kind of focus on a micro level for everything kind of、uh, for everything to kind of fall into place. You know that famous two set violin excerpt. If you can play it slow, you can、mm-hmm. play it fast. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, actually, that's a good transition into slow practicing. Uh, because I love slow practicing, I emphasize slow practicing with my students. But oftentimes, my students are like, ah, you know, forget Mr. M. You know, <laughs> forget.、Mm-hmm. I'll just play everything fast, right? But it's so obvious as a teacher, and you know, like I look back on my days as a student, I'm like, wow, I get what my teachers feel now. Can you share your thoughts on、uh, slow practice and、um, how you approach slow practice with your students at、um, your teaching obligations? Yes. I think that the mistake we make with slow practice is that when we play slow, we think slow, and that's the opposite.、Mm-hmm. We should we should see it that、um, we're playing slow, so we have more time to think and prepare and、uh, create all of these you know neural pathways that we need in the brain to execute it in tempo. We also disconnect reality. 
to slow practice. So we're playing slowly and everything changes. We're all of a sudden not in the same place in the bow. We would play at a tempo. Uh, we're not thinking about uh, a shift, for example, because we're practicing slowly. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention to the speed of the shift because things won't necessarily translate in tempo if we don't pay attention to these small details. There's something really fun I was talking about in my Facebook group the other day, the Mind Over Finger Tribe. Um, there's an application I really like called Modacity. And the Modacity recording uh, platform is really great because you can record yourself. And I'm, I'm sure other applications do this, but I really like the way it's set up in Modacity where you can record and then play it back twice as fast or twice as slow. So sometimes I ask my students to play it twice as slow and record it that way and then listen it in double tempo to see if their slow practice sounds approximately the way it would. Once oh, tempo. wow. That's, that's clever. I didn't even and, think of that. Yeah. And then you start to see that, oh, okay, my subdivision is not really great. Uh, why am I, you know, sliding this way? Uh, that accent is not in the part. It, you know, like you start to see all of the, these little things. And then once you go back and you play it slowly, all of a sudden you've noticed all these new things. You think differently when you're practicing it slowly because now your your ear is being guided towards completely new things to pay attention to and that's really what practicing is is really learning how to pay attention and 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 what to pay attention to sometimes i like to reverse engineer a passage you know sometimes i have to play something fast to understand what i need to work on and then go back from there Absolutely. Like like shifts, shifts, intonation. If I you know if I'm playing something technical like a Paganini caprice, then I will try it fast once, and I'll see how I feel when I play it fast, and then I kind of go from there. I'm like, okay, I know that I need to I need to do something with my elbow. I need to do something with my with my hand frame. So it's th that could also be another practice strategy. May not work for everybody, but I know that sometimes that works for me. I'm like, hmm, I'm kind of stuck maybe I should experiment with the tempos first, see where yes. I can see where I can go from there. Do you have ever, uh, do you ever do that with your students? Do you do that sometimes? Well, I completely agree with you in that a danger of practicing slowly is that sometimes we, mm, what could I say? It's like, we like the courage to start playing it fast, but we mm -hmm. also need to learn how to practice it fast. It's a little bit like a gymnast. Yes. You need to understand the movements that you're ex exact executing sorry another french moment here um but there comes a point where you need your speed and your momentum to execute all of these you know triple axle and things like this or that's in skating doesn't matter same yeah you understand what i'm talking about but but you know it's so interesting that you mention all these sports you mentioned biking you mentioned gymnastics you know violin is a sport in, mm -hmm. in, in every way, you know, there are auditions, there are competitions. And I'd love to discuss competitions in a moment, of course, but you know, it's so funny, like the, you know, we have so much technology around us. And sometimes the best way is just like knowing who you are, knowing what to do in the practice yes. room. It's so incredible. You know, the tempo work is really important because we learn so much. Like I said, yes, we need to practice slowly to understand a lot of things and uh, maybe set the right frames, but we have to practice in tempo also. One thing I love is um, a process I called, I, I borrowed the term from someone else and I forget who, but record, reflect, refine. And um, you play a passage at tempo, recording yourself, either video or audio. If you tend to get distracted by visuals, maybe just listen to it once. But I feel like the video also gives us some excellent cue. And um, so you just play it once in tempo performance, you know, just like this spotlight. Okay, I'm on stage. I'm playing from A to B or even shorter than that. Maybe just four measures in tempo. Listen to it, watch it, and then assess, you know, refine. <laughs> And then yeah. play it right away again without practicing. Just try to execute everything you just thought about and record again. And you do this a few times. And it's really incredible, not only what you think and the solutions that you come up with, but there's also a part of our training that is so embedded deeply inside ourselves that there are things we hear and we see that we will solve even without thinking about it. Like the, the brain identifies it right away, even without us putting words to it or, or 
a, even a thought to it. And then you do that a few times. What I would say, though, is when you do this, the second you find yourself falling into the perfectionism mode, you're getting frustrated and you're starting to feel like you're, you know, butting your head against the wall, I would move on. You've learned what you need to learn and then maybe come back to this passage later. But the second you fall into this um, frustration and this perfection mode where now you're not learning anymore because you're closed off to solutions, uh, you know, your, your judgment is clouded by frustration. So I would say that this is an excellent way of practicing, record, reflect, refine, but don't let frustration enter the room with you. Yeah, and I think that's excellent advice. I love what you said about not being frustrated because a lot of us get frustrated, right? It's easy to get frustrated. I know for me, I maybe back in my youth when I was practicing like so much, but nowadays, and I would love to get your opinion on this, I would, I tend to practice more efficiently in like 20 to 25 minute increments. I cannot do like a one hour long session because my, my brain just gets fried, right? There's so much, there's so much analysis that goes on into practicing, you know, that sometimes it could be overwhelming. I think that's where the frustration comes from. Can you talk about for a moment on how you practice or how you encourage your students to practice and the duration of the practice? I love this question so much. Uh, there's so much talk these days about Pomodoro technique and for me, I just call it Pauline technique because that's my mom's name and she had me do that when I was a kid. So I think that it comes with knowing yourself. Uh -huh. um, I mean, outside of that topic, scheduling, look at your schedule, plan things ahead of time, plan your whole week ahead of time if you have to. That's what I need to do. Know when you're going to practice and know if you are um, what I love Gretchen Rubin's work. She calls them lark. <laughs> you know, the, if you're a morning person, Maybe plan your practice in the morning, or if you're a night owl, maybe you're someone who needs to practice at night. So I think it starts with really knowing yourself. But for example, I know that for me, 25 minutes for the first session of the day is too short because hmm. by 25 minutes, now I'm starting to get into the groove. So my first session, I like it to be 90 minutes. I can sustain focus for that long. Having said that, in that 90 minutes is breaking down into tons of little section. I love practicing with a timer. That right. works for me. Right. Like someone else might yeah. hate that. And yeah. that's what I do too. You know, like what I, what I meant to say was like 25 minute increments, um, you know, like 25 minutes, five minute break, 25 minute, five minute break, that kind of sort mm -hmm. of thing. So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone. I don't practice just 25 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. have a career as a violinist if that were the case. All right. <laughs> no, but I know for me, for example, I'll have kind of a, a pretty clear idea how I will break down that 90 minutes. So I would say I love long tones. I love shradiac scales and I try to keep variety in my technique. So flesh, um, I, I love the Roland Vamos book that's uh, kind of coming from the Korgoff page. Uh, I don't know if anyone here inherited that photocopy, the famous photocopy that was passed down from teachers to students. Um, when I was young, it was just that Korgoff page, but then Roland Vamos put that in the fantastic book. Um, Simon Fisher, oh my gosh, Simon Fisher. Uh, yeah wonderful exercises Simon so like, and Fisher there's a, he has like a whole collection of exercises ranging from hand position vibrato it's incredible I think mm -hmm. it's like it's like one of the violin bibles out there yeah and then you know I then after that I know what I need to work on if it's an audition I might start maybe with the concertos first because um earlier in the day I have more focus but you know it's like I, I will decide how much time I spend on the exposition of the Mozart, how much time will I spend on the cadenza? And if I decide I spend only eight minutes on the cadenza, well, what is the best use of my time? What can I fix? What really, um, I like to think of passages in terms of like green, yellow, and red. So what's my red passage? Because if there's red in the page, I need to go to that. And I'm not saying literally red in the page, but you know, sure. the one passage that needs attention but I also want to keep time for performing it and playing it and recording it. So I think about all of these things and um, we'll see how that works. Then once that first 90 minute is over, as the day goes on, I 
will shorten the sessions because I can't do, you know, 90 minutes times three. Um, so then I will maybe go to an hour and then another hour and then, um, well, I can do a couple 90 minutes. I mean, it, you know, if it's audition mode and you're practicing many hours a day, I would do maybe 90 minutes, 90 minutes and then an hour. Right? You know, it's, it really depends on how you're feeling that day, how much focus you feel like you have and um, knowing yourself. It's all about knowing yourself. In addition to that, first of all, I agree with you 100%. Second of all, you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan of action for the week, for the day. You know, you can't just go into your practice and be like, yeah, I'm just going to practice. <laughs> Just gonna practice whatever I feel like, right? There's mm -hmm. gotta be a goal. You know, if you're not goal setting, then you're that is not mindful practice, right? Yes. Not at all mindful. And I also want to comment in addition to what you said earlier is the fact that perception is different than reality. And it was what you said about the recording, I think I might torture my students now. <laughs> so um, yeah, what we think sounds good may not necessarily sound good to the audience and or vice versa. Well, you know, like what we think might not sound good actually turns out to be great in, in a concert hall and in an audition mm. setting. So Absolutely. that is, um, you know, an experiment. And by the way, all of this takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, we're well into our careers. And, you know, if you implement these strategies throughout a long period of time, you know, in addition to the practicing you've done in, in conservatory or music school, or if you're in your youth listening, this is what it takes, right? And especially mm -hmm. in an ever-growing, uh, you know, musical culture, things are, we're needing to adapt, especially now that we're, a lot of the things are online now, uh, given the, uh, as of this interview, you know, due to the, you know, pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but, you know, the, in earlier episodes of the Violin Podcast, we suggested that, you know, take advantage of this time, you know, especially in the summer. So I would love your, I would love for you to speak about your summer project and how you're implementing, you know, practice methods and changing young musicians' lives over the summer this year. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Um, yes, this pandemic is really interesting. A big part of my work also goes towards self-compassion. And I, I, I like to joke, like, not in the sense that, oh, it's okay to play out of tune. No, not at all. But in the sense that you don't have to hate yourself if you play out of tune. You can exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and so the first thing I did, this was very unplanned, but I like things when they unfold organically. I like to listen to my instinct and to what I feel drawn towards. And I remember clearly this was after my last rehearsal here at the Lyric Opera. And it was becoming very clear that things were going to get canceled. And as a matter of fact, on the way home, I got an email saying that, yes, the, the, the ring cycle was canceled and I was just devastated, just devastated. And my plan was to go to the gym and I decided to do it anyway, because I just, I don't know what else. <laughs> you know what right. Else now you do. have the free time. And I, um, this was before they were closed, of course. Mm -hmm. So I was on the elliptical and, and just feeling kind of in shock and not knowing what to do and not knowing what to think, not knowing what the summer was going to look like, just and devastated to not have the opportunity of playing this incredible, um, you know, this massive masterpiece with my amazing colleagues who'd been working so hard. And I just kept asking myself, but like, what is there left? What is there left? And for me, I know that when I'm, really hurt i i always look for something to do i i need i need to you know act and usually i want to find something that i can do with others so that i have a need for connection and the answer that came to me at some point it just like hit me and then the whole idea came all at once it was just like oh my gosh yes joyful practice i mean the music is left i don't have performances but I became a musician because I love holding this instrument in my hand and playing it. And well, okay, I don't have work for the next few days, but I have my violin, I have the music and I have the time. 
in, you know, I can totally devote time to really treating myself and exploring. So I came with this idea of the joyful practice challenge with which we did in the tribe in March. And um, I released a podcast episode about that last week where I included all of the prompts from the challenge. So it really was a way to kind of take the time, just 10 minutes a day to focus on ways to bring joy and ease and flow and mindfulness in the practice. And it kind of concurred with a time where for years I've been, you know, researching, um, doing a lot of, uh, you know, um, hardcore research. I mean, I don't know if hardcore is the word, but you know, like sound research. It, it, uh, it sounds hardcore. So let's just leave it at that. <laughs> um, really like reading studies, um, everything I could get my hands on, um, analyzing, uh, you know, what I would see in the studio, but also I have a lot of experience myself as a performer mm -hmm. and uh, taking audition and teaching. And I had been working for several months in creating a program that was going to be a online coaching program. And when all of this happened, I thought maybe now is not the time. And they were, were really rattled. And uh, I remember uh, at the end of the challenge, out of the blue, it just came to me like this. I, I told the, the tribe about it. It was like, I came up with this program that was going to come out in June. And now I'm thinking, should I cancel? Because we're so rattled. And right away, people start commenting like, no, launch it because we need that. And when I saw the reaction, I was like, okay, well, we're going to go as planned. So um, this is starting soon, June 1st. It's uh, the Music Mastery Experience, and it's a 12 weeks program on really how to practice mindfully and perform optimally. So it's all of my accumulated experience and knowledge put into one online program. And it's highly personalized because it really, it, you know, it's not a, a online course. You download the video, you watch it, take some notes. That's not what it is. We're all in this together. It's There's not like a webinar, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we meet uh, twice a week. Uh, we have coaching. We talk. We um, problem solve. Uh, I, pre you know, I'll present some concepts for sure. And uh, so we have trainings and coachings and uh, a lot of interaction. And I'm so excited about it because, um, like I said, I love nothing more than to talk music with other people. So that's I'm very excited about this. And I feel like, if anything. And everybody said it since the beginning of this, but if anything, there seems to be a real need for all of us to come together and uh, go back to the essence, which is to share and connect. So in many ways, this pandemic is really devastating for our community. And I don't think we're seeing yet all of the ramifications. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but the silver lining at the same time is I see this beautiful uh, coming together, you know, everyone rallying, uh, showing their best selves, putting things out there, reaching out, connecting. So it's a mixed blessing for sure. Yeah, there, um, you know, my, my wife and I, we talk about the, the silver lining, you know, what is, what are the, what can be the benefit of this COVID-19 pandemic? You know, thousands of people are, you know, are, are, you know, are devastated by getting, having this virus. But, you know, I think that through this pandemic, it's showed us how we, how much we need art in the world, how much we need music in the world. It is so clearly obvious that, you know, a lot of the people who are sitting at home and who are not artists, you know, they're listening to music because it helps comfort them, right? And that is mm -hmm. our job as a musician to, not just not just play music but to share music and you know that's that's why i wanted to bring up your program because i think it's such a fabulous idea i think is what we need right now and it's just it's just a great idea so thank you for sharing that and is there a way this podcast episode will be probably released in the middle of your program are people able to join in or is it kind of like limited limited slots available kind of thing? Yeah, there's limited slots available because I really want to keep it to um, a group, right? Because it's really an experience where we support and inspire each other. And it's important to feel like it's a, you know, a small family. So mm -hmm. there's limited spots. The program starts June 1st. So the, you know, the door will close before that. But I will be running it again in January. So my plan is to run it twice a year. 
Wonderful. I would, I would love to uh, learn more about that, you know, once that time comes during the winter month. And, you know, just to comment on the uncertainty right now, I think everybody listening and watching are not sure what's going to happen. I think mm-hmm. that is a big, you know, there's a big if, you know, what, like what's going to happen. Uh, you know, a lot of class, classical music organizations, and this is real talk right now. And, you know, this is, you know, part of the business. We have to kind of figure it out together. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know what's going to happen if, you know, the, you know, by January, if things are going to open up, maybe they might open up sooner, they might open up later. But my guess, um, unfortunately, is probably going to be later more than sooner because mm-hmm. of, you know, the, the, you know, the gathering of large crowds, especially in our business, you know, that's, um, there's a, there's a definitely a high risk involved in that. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are, virtual performances, virtual classes, you know, you're obviously going to be hosting a virtual workshop. Do you see this heading in the direction? Do you think that this is the pivot in our classical music history right now that we're going to be looking back on this and be like, what, you, you know what I mean? You know, mm-hmm. the question I'm trying to ask, I was wondering your yeah. thoughts. It's, uh, I think there's two aspects of it. I strongly believe in online education. Um, I've been in that world for a while. I've had coaches I have a coach right now. She's in California and I have, you know, people in my program all over the world. And it's so amazing because there are no barriers anymore. Mm -hmm. You want to learn from someone if they don't live 10 miles from you, that's not a problem. So I really believe that in the right format, online education is incredible. It's amazing. Plus you never have to leave your house. It's awesome. Yeah. That Um, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Yes. (laughs) Having said that, yes, it's fine to check on my students from time to time, but I I think that there is a need for, you know, one-to-one in-person teaching uh, for instrumental mastery for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when it comes to online education, it's a great way to give notions and concepts and yeah, you can do, you know, maybe check in here and there checking that all the notes are there and the rhythm and the, you know you can even maybe check a little bit of the form and the bow hold things like this but it's really difficult to look exactly at what you want when you are limited by what the image is for you on the screen so yeah i i, I don't think that um it needs it should be limited to online in terms of instrumental uh, education it's difficult uh, but I think they can work together really really well um, and then for performances it's tricky because you know I think that there's so many amazing things out there I love all of the live performances that have been happening uh, but we're definitely going to have to rethink this format in terms of like what is going to happen for orchestra performances in the future um, so I don't know what direction this will go in Mm -hmm. I'm already seeing some chamber music groups coming back together and doing live streaming um, with really high quality equipment. So it's like broadcast quality equipment. That's, that's pretty great. I think if, if there is a way to uh, figure out a platform where, you know, it's like a virtual concert hall, I mean, that already exists for sure, but there's a way to maybe make that a little bit easier for the public. Um, I'm not sure. There's so many directions. So many questions, right? And I, you know, and I asked this, um, especially in last week's episode with Timothy Chui, that I, you know, we talked about, you know, because he's a soloist, and what what does it mean for him, especially now that all the concerts are canceled through the fall, mm. and that's that's going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge. I'm curious to know what kind of solutions we'll come up with, and if you have ideas, please leave them in the comments section because. Uh, you know, we're trying to make these, you know, music communities, a community and a family. So leave the comments down below and, you know, not, no idea is a bad idea at this point, you know, trying everything. I think so, human beings are so resilient and so resourceful. I think that a year from now, we're probably going to be amazed at like what we came up with as solutions. It's unclear right now, like you say, but I, I you know, I don't think we're going to give up. 
I sure hope not. And I hope that we'll just continue. We'll just continue pushing on and be resilient, as you said. My last question for you, uh, before we get to the violent podcast trivia, which is one of my favorites, and my my question for you is, just like the uh, question that I asked previous guests on the violent podcast, what does it mean to be a musician to you? And you might have touched on this earlier, but you know, what does it mean to be a musician for you in the year twenty twenty? Mm. Well, I don't know in the year 2020 or maybe the year 2020 really actually gives us all the opportunity to embody what we want to be as musician because we really have to think hard. We can't just go through the motions and follow the path as we've been doing in the past. Um, you know, what's interesting is for me, I started when I was so young and it's almost as if Renee the violinist is such a big part of who Renee is that they're almost impossible to disassociate. Um, it's so much of my identity. And I think that what it's given me in terms of, you know, the things that we've discussed, it's, it's a journey, it's a path. It never stops. We always grow, we always evolve. And I think that it, it really has given me uh, the curiosity to always search for more. And the other thing that I love about it is really, I mean, kind of a big reason why I became a musician was how much fun I was having at youth orchestra. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. it is this, is this coming together, this, I mean, I think we've all felt it. I mean, one of my favorite composers is Shostakovich. And I remember the first time I played Shostakovich 7 and just like the hair rising in the back of my neck when you're sitting in the middle of this mass of sound with so many other human beings thinking in sync, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and really just, you know, you, you really feel like you're part of something that's much greater than yourself. I just, I, I love that so much. Well, that's all so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Now, before we leave, Island Podcast Trivia. All right. This has been so fun. Although I had to kind of tweak up the rules a little bit because I originally had it for 25 seconds, you know, where you have to answer really quickly. But I the questions were so long that I'm like, okay, let's <laughs> let, let me revamp the trivia. So so now the rules are you have to I, I will um i will present the question and then you'll have three seconds to answer it after i say the last word all right that's good so that way you know you could kind of think about it <laughs> as i ask the question <laughs> that's one number two is so that way i don't have to like stumble over my words in the in the trivia all right so here and by we the go. way if i miss any answers i will blame my children because this homeschooling thing is killing all of my brain cells that's fair that's fair <laughs> great so i have five questions all right by the way you have to get three of the five questions right in order to mm -hmm. get a prize from me so there's that so now question one are you ready well, do I get to a minute to center before? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, let's let's see if we can practice that <laughs> mindful practice methods right before violent podcast review. We need to be in that Zen mode. Um, great. So, question one: What was the last opera Mozart composed? Oh my gosh, Don Giovanni. Unfortunately, it is not Don Giovanni. Although spectacular opera, but it's La Clemenza di Tito, mm. which is the last one. And actually, as a matter of fact, I saw a performance of Clemenza di Tito five years ago at the Chicago Lyric Opera. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good. Question two. Verdi wrote one smaller scale piece outside of opera. Can you name that piece? <laughs> I can't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. He wrote a string quartet. So oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. He wrote a string quartet. Apparently it was like a complete joke, but he wrote it anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, good. Question three. This composer was known for the light motif. Mm. Wagner. 
Bam. You got it. All right. Got one right. <laughs> Question four. You need to get the rest of these questions right to get the prize from me. Yes. So, I want that mug. Yes. It is a, it's a fabulous mug. I like that mug. <laughs> uh, question four. The opera Dido and Aeneas was composed by who? Oh, my gosh. I forget. Henry Purcell. Oh, that's right. Henry Purcell. It's a it's a one it's for anyone who doesn't know Dido and Aeneas. One <laughs> short it's it's an hour it's an hour long. It's a very short opera. Very lovely. I didn't know this was gonna be opera centered. I was I thought it was gonna be all like practice questions. Well you're <laughs> <laughs> well, well you said you played in the Chicago lyric, so figured that these are fitting. Okay. So this is the this is the last one, hardest one. In the eighteenth century this European orchestra was one of the most active musical centers in Europe and became internationally famous for its impeccable discipline and technique. Mozart was a fan of this orchestra. I'll give you more oh, than three seconds for oh, this is, one. Oh, is that the end of the question? Yes. Uh, Vienna Phil? I don't know. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was the Mannheim Orchestra. Mannheim. Mannheim. And there's a very interesting, um, actually, I did a paper on it uh, back in my grad school days. Um, Mozart loved the Mannheim Orchestra and, uh, you know, the Sinfonia Concertant for violin and viola. You know, a lot of those, you know, orchestral techniques and musical elements, he got inspiration from, uh, from the Mannheim Orchestra. So that was, so that was a little fun fact. Anyways, we don't have the opportunity to give you that mug. So, <laughs> but maybe in a future podcast episode, uh, we can do a different game and you can have another prize. But I'll be sure to send you a violin podcast sticker as a good measure for participating. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Renee, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Violin Podcast. For anyone watching or listening, please make sure to uh, visit the Mind Over Finger podcast. You won't regret it. It's a great podcast for uh, violin practice tips, strategies, how-tos from violinists around the world. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. And thank you so much for this really awesome uh, program that you're putting together. Mm -hmm.